First level of learning. Paper 9, Nephilim, The Fallen Angels. Posted on January 27, 2019. By Wes Penra. Thursday, April 7, 2011. 1. Abstract, The Sitchin Version. You who have read Sitchin's Earth Chronicles, or even one or two books in the series, are already familiar with the term Anunnaki Anu.na.ki. Those who from heaven to earth came. Figure 1, Zkaria Sitchin. Zkaria Sitchin minus 1920-2010 was a Russian linguist and author latter a New York resident, who took on as his life mission to translate the old Sumerian clay tablets. I am not going to go into much details here about how Sitchin came to his conclusions, as this can be studied elsewhere, but in general, he found that about 450, 000 years ago an advanced race of creator gods came to Earth from their home planet, Nibiru-ni.bi.ru, or, a.a.m.e, in their own language pronounced, Shaomai? To cut or break creation red ochre plus watery father plus office ideal norm, in the, a.a.m.e, language, an imagir, having nearly identical meanings in Sumerian as well. According to Sitchin's translations, they didn't originally come here as settlers, but to dig gold and minerals, something that Earth was and still is rich on. Figure 2, Sumerian Tablet in Cuneiform With time, this space-bound warrior race decided to use the existing primates as slaves in their minds and started an additional genetic manipulation of the early humans. The Sumerians, who left accounts of their myth inscribed on cuneiform tablets some 5,000 years ago, tell a spectacular story of these gods who came down and ruled over them. Not only do these tablets tell their present time story, but they also told the story of their own creation, and how the gods arrived on Earth and manipulated the DNA of early humans. Apparently, these stories were taught to the Sumerian people by this warrior race and go back about 450,000 years in time. Even today, these stories and more are passed down to a few initiates into the mystery schools and secret societies around the world. As we shall see, this species is equivalent to the biblical fallen angels and Nephilim. Zkaria Sitchin has been accused of many things from being a complete fraud who's making it all up, or being a government disinformation agent, a shape-shifting reptilian. Part of the establishment, because he went to a famous university, and more. But at the end of the day, his translations and conclusions are surviving the winds of time. Of course, he was human, and was not always right voice. But he did a good job in helping us understand our past. And not only can we see the effects today from what the Sumerians wrote on their clay tablets and thus see that this is not a fable, but there are, like I've mentioned earlier, people who have actually met with the a.a.m.i from their home planet, a.a.m.e, and these beings have told them that most of Sitchin's work is right on. If I ever had any doubts about its authenticity, I do no more. Sitchin did the best he could with what he had at his convenience. I'm convinced about it. However, just because he did an outstanding job translating the tablets doesn't mean that the tablets were totally accurate. I have reasons to believe that on some accounts, the scribes, who wrote down what's on the cuneiform tablets, were not always told the truth by those who dictated them, the Anunnaki. Scholars and others may object and say that these tablets were not written by one person, and not everything was dictated, so that doesn't hold water, but it does. Most probably, the present time which the Sumerians were depicting in clay was most certainly correct from their point of view, but the past history of Earth, seen from their present, was to some extent altered to more fit into certain agendas, planned by a faction and sometimes most of the Anunnaki themselves. We know for a fact that Mardigra changed the Earth history at least once, and Nangish Zydathoth probably did, too, and there were more. Still, they didn't bother keeping their own struggle with each other off the record, 
clearly showing the character of many of these beings. On the other hand, they probably had little choice, because the humans knew how they were. Despite this fact, Sitchin's version is a must-read if we want to know our own true history and our origins. This alien species had reasons to edit out and change a few things, because they also knew that those from the home planet would return to Earth one day, and they had to prepare humanity for this, so that their arrival would be as smooth as possible. In this first level of learning, I will concentrate on the Anunnaki, although there were other alien species here during the time the Anunnaki had their peak time on Earth. The Sumerian scriptures make it sounds like they were the only gods here, which was not the case Somethenji wrote about in Genesis paper number 1, Human Origins and the Living Library. We will bring up other races too in future papers. And in the second level of learning, I will tell the deeper story about the Anunnaki as it were, and as it is, according to my own research. However, this subject is so vast everything is, isn't it? That it's more than enough, as a starter, to bring Sitchin's material into new light. And another reason why I am separating out this species from many of the others is that they are the ones who have had the most influence on humankind of all ET races from 300. 000 years ago up to present time. The curious thing is that although most people think that this was all in the past, in fact, the Anunnaki never left. Some of them stayed, and there was only a short period of time, during the second half of the first millennium AD when they all left. And this world was left with humans only for the first time in perhaps a quarter of a million years. One misconception that I want to point out already now is that some people think that at least we owe the Anunnaki for manipulating our DNA. Without their intervention, we would still be apes running around on the savannas and in the bushes. This is exactly what the Anunnaki want us to believe, and that's one of their best cards. My viewpoint, backed up by research, shows another picture. We shall go into that after the story about the Anunnaki on Earth is told, Sitchin's version, mind you. But don't think for a second that it's not worth reviewing Sitchin's translations. They are gems, in my opinion. If you are not totally familiar with them, and don't know who is who in the saga, please review my papers in regards to the Anunnaki. And if you're new to them, here is the story in condensed form. Before we start discussing the huge influence of the Anunnaki on Earth and human history, I want to pay my tribute, not only to Sitchin and those who came after, but also to the anthropologist, Dr. Sasha Lesson, whom have spent a lot of time putting Sitchin's pieces together in a fluent, coherent format, which makes it read like one compressed novel through his Enki Speaks essays. This has been very helpful in my own studies to grasp the wealth of Sitchin's research. And I have used Lessons essays as a resource quite a bit in my own Anunnaki papers to make Sitchin's work more available to the public. Now, before we introduce Sitchin's work further, let's start by going back in time some 4.2-4.5 billion years to see how the Anunnaki themselves were seeded and created. 2. The Seeding of the Syrian Anunnaki There are human scientists, astrophysicists, quantum physicists, linguists, and those with other specialties, who have come together in a physics research group called the LPG Sealift Physics Group California. They are currently meeting with ETS on a regular basis, both in physical, mind-to-mind -mind communication, and through neurosensing about neurosensing, see my paper, Exploring the Unum, the Ever-Expanding Multiverse. Due to this, we have learned so much more about ET civilizations, both in the past and in the present. Others, like George Lobuono, who wrote Alien Mind, also use neurosensing to connect and interact with extraterrestrial beings. This may sound like science fiction to many people, but I have interacted with this group, read a lot of material over the last year related to these subjects, and to me it is now almost routine. And I sometimes find myself thinking that amazingly enough, almost nobody on this planet knows that this is happening. 
It's in order to be skeptical about all this, and so was I, for a long time, until I had read so much astonishing material and connected the dots, that there were no longer any doubts in my mind that this is actually going on. In the sections, present and future challenges and solutions, I will go into much more details about this group, how things are connected out there in the multiverse, and what I know so far about what is going on here on Earth and in Earth near space. The following story about how the A.A.M.I were created was told me by Dr. A. R. Borden from the Life Physics Group California. Some 4.2-4.5 billion years ago up to about 6 billion years ago or longer. The time frame is uncertain. Life was seated on a planet which orbited Sirius C, which then was a bright, hot, blue star, probably of spectral class B a blue star sun. This planet is the same one we today call Nibiru. It was surrounded by 11-12 satellites and the planet itself is about six times the size of Earth. As we have discussed in a previous paper, life doesn't magically appear in the universe. It is seeded, or panspermed, which is the technical term for it. Figure 3, Tall White Female Nibiru, A.A.M.E, was panspermed by an older race from a neighboring star system. We know this to be true, but who really did it is still not totally clear. There are a few theories, though, built on information gathered by contacts with different ET groups, so I am going to be flexible here and give a couple of theories. This murky area needs some more research, though, and there is just a matter of time before we will know. I will eventually write an update. The first theory is given to me by Dr. Borden is that the Nibir ruins were panspermed by a race known in UFO circles as the Tall Whites. This humanoid ET group, 5.7-9 feet tall, with snow white hair, almond shaped, oval eyes and white skin, are still here on Earth, occupying a base in the Nevada desert, close to Nellis Air Force Base AFB. They have hinted that they come from a star system close to Arcturus. Figure 4, possibly E.N.K.I., a Nunaki royalty, depicted with ear jewelry, beard, long hair, standing outside a Middle Eastern stargate. A second, and perhaps more likely one, is that the A.A.M.I. were created from had been genetically engineered by the Lyrans, just like we were to begin with. What speaks in favor of this theory is that they look very similar to how the Lyrans are normally depicted. Caucasian looking, much taller than today's humans, and the men almost always had full beards, sometimes braided, and the men also often had long hair. We are now talking about the species which is most commonly depicted in Sumerian cuneiform, but I have reason to believe that by the time the A.A.M.I visited Earth. They were a mix of more than one species, working in unison. At least one of these other species was reptilian. Figure 5, statue from Old Summer, which clearly shows a reptilian being. A third theory is that the A.A.M.I is just a subgroup of the Lyrans, who developed on their own, without much intervention with their Lyran brothers and sisters. They created their own reality, became conquerors of their own and teamed up with whomever they wanted. In this version we are going to use the Tall Whites TWS are their creator gods until we can get that confirmed or not. The way the TWS look, we can see they are also originating from Lyra. Perhaps 2-3 billion years after Nibiru had been seeded and intelligent life forms had developed on the planet. The a.A.M.I. noticed that Sirius C was becoming unstable and would soon turn into a nova. When this happened, it would wipe out all life on the planet. If we use the Borden's version so of it which he got from the A.A.M.I. themselves, by the way, what the TWS did was to speed up the evolution on Nibiru. 
so that the humanoid species they had seeded with their own DNA antenna from other more primitive species could become advanced enough to space travel and perhaps be able to leave the star system before the inevitable catastrophe. 3. One catastrophe after another. According to LPGC, not too long before Sirius C became a nova, the A.A.M.I were turned into a civilization type 1, with help from the TWS. In order for the A.A.M.I to survive the upcoming catastrophe, the Nibir ruins were taught how to control the energy resources of their giant planet, and also how to control earthquakes, weather changes, and energy resources. In addition, they learned about genetic engineering and manipulation of DNA. This showed to be vital for their survival, because if they were not at least a Type 1 civilization at the time for the catastrophe, the whole species would have been extinct when the planet was engulfed by the Red Giant, which is the next step in a star's development after the Nova stage. The Red Giant would have absorbed Nibiru and burned it to ashes, something that probably happened to the other planets in the Sirius C system, if there were any. Figure 6 Sirius A, B, and C, showing their relative orbits around each other. Xylanthia is a planet which is supposedly still orbiting Sirius C, but is not Nibiru. I am still gathering information on what exactly happened next, but it seems that for some reason or another, the A.A.M.I went to war against the Tall Whites their own creator gods, and they defeated the TWS and won the war. What I heard was that the conflict is still unresolved, and the A.A.M.I and the Tall Whites are still enemies, although they are no longer openly fighting each other. The A.A.M.E civilization peaked around 36,000 years or 10 SARS before the catastrophe happened about 4.2 to 4.5 billion years ago Sirius C then turned Nova became a red giant and a few million years later retracted into a white dwarf star however well before that Nibiru was catapulted out of its orbit probably due to the instability of its sun or perhaps also with the help of technology the A.A.M.I were prepared, though, and had moved underground after had been taught by the TWS how to handle energy, which means they knew how to keep a tolerable temperature to stay alive. It is my understanding that they knew how to tame the energy stemming from the planetary core and could use that energy as a second sun and thus get the heat they needed from inside their planet. Instead from the outside sun, Eventually, they were also able to create an artificial atmosphere, using gold as one of the components, so they could start living on the rocky, desert-like surface on the only existing continent on Nibiru. Gold works as a conductor, and if heat is emitting from the center of the planet and gold can be spread into the atmosphere, that heat bounces back and can be used to heat up the surface of the planet so it can again be inhabitable. Nibiru was catapulted out of its orbit with such a force that it lost its connection with the gravity of the Sirius solar system and aimed for deep space. Their old star system disappeared in the distance forever. Nibiru was never to return to Sirius again. After thousands, or more possibly, millions of years on a steady course through deep space, Nibiru, the red planet with its 11 satellites was drawn into our own young solar system 8.6 light years away from Sirius by the gravity from Neptune it entered the solar system in retrograde from an angle came in from the south and headed towards another giant planet in our own solar system Tiamat located between today's Mars and Jupiter Earth at this time, was not even created. One of Nibiru's satellites hit Diamat and split it in half before the red planet left the solar system and continued its journey back into deep space. However, Nibiru had now become a member of our solar system, but was on a much longer, 
highly elliptic orbit, and only return to our immediate solar system every 3.600 years, give or take 70 years. Both Borden and Sitchin tell us that Tiamat was destroyed this way, while all metaphysical sources, independent of each other that I've listened to, are saying that Tiamat and Mars were populated long after Earth was created. Most sources, besides the two above, say that Tiamat was destroyed by those who lived on the planet, from misuse of energy, and not because of a collision between the planet and Nibiru's moons. However, for our purpose, we are for now sticking with Sitchin's version. So, one far later, the newly adopted planet came back and hit the same spot again. This time it split one of the halves of Tiamat into pieces, which thereafter became the asteroid belt. The other half of Tiamat was thrown out of orbit from the impact and came closer to the sun. This damaged planet became Earth. We can, allegedly, still see evidence of the impact from Nibiru's satellite when our planet was split in half, in the Pacific Ocean. Once again, Nibiru left the solar system for another SAR, leaving Earth to its fate. Figure 7, Nibiru hits Tiamat, and Earth kicked out of its orbit. What happened next is what was described in my previous paper, Human Origins and the Living Library. After Earth had been seeded by the Founders and eventually the Vegans and the Lyrans continued where the Founders left off. The Pleiadians tell us more about the variety of creator gods and other alien races existing simultaneously on the planet, creating their own civilizations side by side on another CD I listened to. They say that some of these were developed in Russia and even in the Arctic and Antarctica, which were then not covered with ice but had forests and lakes due to that the polar regions were located differently from now. There are still remnants of these millions of years old civilizations to be found under the ice caps. Both buildings and skeletons of giants and other, to us unfamiliar species. Some of the civilizations were run by both Lyrans, Vegans and Pleiadians, while in fact were a subgroup of the Lyrans. Due to wars and misuse of technology, these early civilizations died out and are buried underwater, ice and land, and creation to some extent had to start all over again. At the time when the Neanderthals and Homo erectus walked the Earth, our planet was still monitored by Lyrans, Pleiadians, and others, but apparently on a skeleton crew. Eventually, as told in my previous paper, the Lyrans and the Pleiadians were run off the planet and the solar system as a direct consequence of an atomic war, which was won by the A.A.M.I group. This early part of Earth history is missing in Sitchin's writings, which I believe is due to that the A.A.M.I and their subgroup, the Anunnaki, destroy these records and changed history to their favor. They had no wish to tell mankind that they had run off their real creator gods with atomic bombs. They wanted to make us believe that the Anunnaki themselves were our creators. Now we are ready to let Sitchin take over, here presented in a condensed form by myself with help from Sitchin's original books and Dr. Sasha Lesson and his own condensed version, Enki Speaks. Dash don't forget to click on the end notes. There are some interesting comments there. If you click the link, for example, it takes you to the end note section, and when you've read it, just click the back button on your browser and it takes you back to where you were in the text. 4. In the days of old, in the days of gold. As usual, there were conflicts happening on Nibiru, and 450,000 years ago, their present king, Alalu, was deposed by his nephew, the new king, 
whose name was on you, Elalu's cupbearer. At the same time, Nibiru became depleted of gold in the atmosphere, and their inhabitants were also preparing for space travel again to find a planet which could provide them with the precious metal. If they couldn't find any to pump into their atmosphere, it would erode. A process that had already started. Apparently, they used gold because it's an excellent conductor, and because they no longer had a sun to warm up the planet except for a very short time every 3,600 years. When their planet enters our solar system, they could use this precious metal to warm up the atmosphere, probably by using the heat that was emitting from the core of the planet. Figure 8, a young Anu, Alalu's cube error. However, there was a problem. The average lifespan of a A.A.M.I is a little over 100 SARS minus 360,000-420,000 Earth years, taking into account that they stay on their own planet. But their lifespan could be extended much more than that with the help of technology, which I will cover later. As explained in my paper, known life forms within the Milky Way and beyond, minus 2011, when we are born, we are indexed into the planet we incarnate to and are subjected to their sense of time, which is different on different worlds. Here on Earth, we are indexed to live 70-120 years at most, while on Nibiru it's 360,000 years. Every species we know of in the galaxy and beyond are working on extending their lifespan as part of their evolvement. And once the technique is found usually through the above-mentioned nanotechnology, a species can extend their lives considerably. The A.A.M.I also were capable of using nanotechnology and could extend their lives up to perhaps a couple of million years, or close to it. However, just like here on Earth, on Nibiru there were people, more or less fortunate. The kings and those of royal bloodline could choose to use nanotech if they wanted to apparently not everybody did, and live almost forever, in our terms. But the average worker was normally not allowed to use it, perhaps because of population control, still, as soon as they leave their planet, their lifespan shortens quite drastically because they are no longer subjected to the same time indexing as on their own planet. If a species has a short lifespan, as humans do, we could gain from leaving Earth, but in the case of the A.A.M.I, it was the opposite. The solution again, was gold. This species uses nanotechnology while on planet and monatomic gold when off planet to keep themselves relatively young. Apparently, it doesn't totally do the trick, but the shortening in longevity is marginal if using gold when spacefaring. So, in other words, the A.A.M.I were needing gold, both for their depleted atmosphere and for space travel. This was the situation when Alalu Alau was overthrown and decided to flee from Nibiru. The opportunity came when Nibiru entered our solar system and came closest to Earth. Although he knew his life was going to be much shorter on Earth, he would probably stand the chance to live longer on Earth than on his home planet, if they were out to kill him or force him to commit suicide. Figure 9, Drawing Form Zichin, Z, 2004, The Earth Chronicles Expeditions, page 26. Sitchin drew in the pilot, Originally it was headless. Alalu stole a rocket ship filled with nuclear weapons and headed for Earth. He landed on the Virgin-like planet and found it beautiful to the extreme. Deep forests, high mountains, mighty oceans, rich on animal life and plenty of all imaginable resources. Still, he chose to land in a rocky desert because that's what he was used to from his own rocky, desert-like home planet. When he noticed he wasn't followed, he relaxed and started exploring his environment more carefully, and one day he found gold other minerals, in abundance. He immediately realized that Earth could be the solution to all their urgent, pressing problems. This was exactly what he needed. He hurried and pointed the nuclear weapons towards Nibiru and told King Anu that there was a lot of gold on Earth, 
And if Alalu did not get his throne back, the Nibia ruins could kiss goodbye to both their planet and the Earth's resources. The deposed king felt satisfied with himself and withdrew to await an answer. Figure 10, King Anu. The answer came eventually. Anu decided to send his first son, Ia meaning he whose home is waters, to Earth together with 50 male astronauts and scientists to find out if Alalu spoke the truth. Ia's pilot, Anzu, steered their sim through the asteroid belt and had to use an advanced form of water cannons to shoot rocks out of the way so the spaceship wasn't hit. In fact, they used more than was expected and got depleted of water before they reached Earth. They knew there was water on Mars, so they made a middle landing there to fill up the resources. At this time, Mars had an atmosphere and plenty of water as well. The atmosphere was too thin for breathing, though, so they had to wear helmets when entering the planet's surface. Well loaded, the team once again set their course towards Earth. The thought of finding gold was driving them on their mission. Without it their whole civilization was threatened. Soon, Ia's rocket ship entered Earth's atmosphere and splashed into the Persian Gulf. Alalu was there and helped them ashore. Figure 11, Ia, the Enki. Ia and his team found that Alalu had spoken the truth, so they started powdering the gold into fine dust and found that it was certainly good enough to fill their purposes. It could be used both to save Nibiru and for maintaining longevity during space travel. The Nibirons, on Anu's directives, ordered the team to send it up to the planet in Alalu's ship, so they could, via contrails, spread the gold through the atmosphere. Ia complied. But before he sent the first load of gold, he removed the nuclear missiles from Alalu's ship and hid them in a cave in the African Great Lakes area with the assistance of Ibgul, whom he trusted. There were seven missiles, which were later used to nuke Sodom and Gomorrah and the Sinai spaceport. Anzu, Ia's pilot, objected and said that during their trip to Earth, by using water cannons, they almost killed the engine, and the nuclear weapons were needed for the trip through the asteroid belt. Ia got aggravated and replaced Anzu as interplanetary pilot with Abgol, who was willing to follow Ia's directives and return to Nibiru in Alalu's spaceship, without the nukes. The mission had been successful. The Nibiruan scientists managed to refine the gold even more once it was returned to the home planet, and it was extracted into the atmosphere with desired results. Anu was pleased and left Ia and his crew on Earth, while Nibiru left the solar system for yet another long, elliptic journey before the planet once again entered our solar system after one czar. The A.A.M.I, who stayed on Earth, and those who followed, became known as the Anunnaki those who, who from heaven to earth came by the Sumerians, and are the fallen angels of the Hebrew Bible. Says Sitchin, the ones who stayed on the home planet Nibiru are equivalent to the biblical Elohim. When Nibiru finally returned, the planet's atmosphere was once again almost depleted of gold, and to their disappointment they noticed that Ia hadn't been able to collect very much new gold on Earth. However, it was enough to once again fill the atmosphere. Ia decided to make another flight over the planet and suddenly found gold in Southeast Africa. Lots of it. He was very excited when he announced this to the home planet. Ia must have been quite lazy, or caught up in something he thought was more important than to provide his home planet with life-sustaining gold. Or he would have come up with this idea earlier and been able to find the solution well in time before Nibiru's next passing, and not after the fact that Nibiru returned, finding himself almost empty-handed. Or perhaps, for some reason he didn't have access to the equivalent to a shuttle or an airplane while left alone with his crew on Earth. It's hard to believe that's the case, though. Namer, 
Ea's half-brother and Anu's second son, was angry and jealous that Ea was assigned the Earth mission, and when he heard the news that his brother had found huge veins of gold, he questioned it. He said that Ea had promised a lot of gold from the waters of the Persian Gulf, and look, the source was depleted almost immediately. Neymar wanted proof, not only of gold, but the abundance of it. Figure 12, Neymar, the Enlil. Anu agreed, and sent his second born down to Earth to see for himself. He found that indeed there was probably enough gold in Africa to save the planet, something Neymar had to admit. Ian and Neymar had always been competitors, and both wanted to be in charge of the Earth mission, so the former played a trick on Ian and Anu. He sent a message up to his father on Nibiru that he, Neymar, needed to be in charge of this mining project and Ia should work under him. Besides, Alalu started getting restless down on Earth and had started ranting about being king of both Nibiru and Earth. This message made King Anu come down to Earth in an effort to resolve the issues. This was not the last time he had to resolve conflicts between the two competing half-brothers. He found Ia and Neymar in dispute with each other, so King Anu decided to draw lots, and Neymar won. Discouraged, Ia was sent to South Africa to start the mining, no longer in charge, and he brought his team of Anunnaki with him. This happened 416,000 years ago. Eden Mesopotamia was assigned to Neymar, who now earned the title, the Ian.Lil, Lord Command, while Ian was granted the oceans as his domain and put to govern Abzu Southeast Africa, becoming in charge of the mining project. Neymar was the one who gave Ia the title, the Ian.Ki, Lord Earth. Much later, in Greece and Rome, Ia became known as Neptune and Poseidon, respectively. The Enlil became Zeus and Jupiter, respectively. As a side note, we still can find many hints of the Anunnaki influence on our language. One of them being Enki Lord of Earth falling back on Ia, which most possibly gave the name to our planet, Earth. Next thing King Anu had to deal with was the former King Lalu. Anu confronted the old king and they started wrestling. Anu was the younger and stronger one, and put his foot on Lalu's chest while he was lying on the ground. A sign of victory. However, when Anu let go, Lalu bit off Anu's manhood as a last revenge. This is something the Anunnaki gods do as a principle, it appears. Often, when they defeat each other in battle, they cut off each other's manhood and throw it away so that person can't reproduce anymore. It's apparently in an attempt to stop that certain bloodline from producing more of themselves. By doing this, the gods eliminate the threat that the defeated person's future sons come back and take revenge, but it's also a sign of power. However, the story doesn't tell why Alalu had been out of the picture for so long. He threatened to nuke his home planet if he wasn't getting his throne back, but when Ia came down to check it out, he took over and started delivering gold to Nibiru. Not a word about what Alalu did in the meantime. Perhaps it's just clay tablets missing. Figure 13, Anu fights Alalu. Anu immediately got first aid and his manhood could be sewed back in place again. When Anu recovered, he was furious and deported Alalu to Mars, together with his former pilot, Anzu, whom Ia had fired. For unknown reasons, biting off someone else's manhood could lead to death. Some shook us from some kind of poisoning effect. However, Alalu survived being saved by the crew who were supposed to leave him dying on Mars. The old king recovered and survived. Figure 14, Ninma. Anu, now back on Nibiru, decided to create space stations in the solar system, on Mars and the Earth moon, which was the lost moon of Nibiru when it first hit Diamat. He also said that if Alalu was alive, he should be allowed to start a colony on Mars. Anu sent his daughter Ninma with a crew of female health officers to Earth, but were asked to middle land on Mars to check out the situation there. They found both Alalu and Anzu dead, 
But they managed to revive Anzu with advanced medical equipment and knowledge. Alalu, to this day, is buried on Mars. After all, Alalu had been king of A.A.M.E. Nibiru. So to commemorate Alalu, Ninma and Anzu let carve out his face on the great mountain Sindonia. They depicted him wearing an eagle helmet. Ia later married Amkina, who was Alalu's daughter, and their offspring was Marduk, who had a great influence on humankind, often in not so favorable manners. Before Ninma left Mars, she gave Anzu 20 of their people to build the first way station for the gold freighters. Figure 15, Alalu's face on Mars photographed before the NASA cover-up. 5. The Unsettling Settlers Ia and Namer, as we've mentioned, were half-brothers. Ia was the eldest, born from Anu's first marriage, while Namer, the Enlil, was born from a marriage between Anu and Antu. Ninma, on the other hand, was born out of a third relationship Anu had, and was thus half-sister with both Namer and Ia. Anu had early decided that Ia and Ninma should become spouses, so that their offspring could be the legal heir. However, Namer took advantage of the situation and seduced Ninma, who gave birth to Ninurta. This was extremely aggravating to Anu. He was furious, but couldn't do much about it except forbidding Ia and Ninma to be spouses after this incident, and instead Amkina was chosen for Ia. When Ninma and her crew of nurses and health officers landed on Earth, the Enlil once again tried to seduce her, but failed in the attempt. He promised her everything she needed for her project to be a success, but she refused to have sex with him again. Instead, much as a revenge, it seems, Namer raped Sud, one of Ninma's beautiful nurses, an incident which had some bad repercussions. So, Anu was furious, and Ia was as well, understandably so. He felt his brother had taken advantage of the situation to guarantee a heir of his direct bloodline on the throne. This was just one of many incidences causing conflicts between the two half-brothers. This conflict goes on up until today, as both of them are still alive. Before 50 of the Anunnaki, Namer was punished for rape by being exiled from the cities. Namer left today's Lebanon together with Abgol, who became his pilot. However, unbeknownst to everybody, Abgol was the man who had seen Ia hide Alalu's missiles. Abgol and the Enlil left for Africa, but on their way there, Abgol secretly landed outside the cave where he and Ia had hidden the nuclear missiles, and showed these to Namer, thus betraying Ia to side with his younger brother. Namer and Abgol kept their knowledge secret, and Namer decided he could potentially use the weapons if needed in the future to gain power. Now, the Enlil again approached Sud, whom he raped, and asked her to marry him, mostly to regain his status, I would presume. Sud said she'd only marry him if he made her his royal wife, and so he did. She became Nilil, Lady Command. Just like Namer had foreseen, he was pardoned and the marriage took place, whereafter Namer could return to Lebanon. He was very pleased, because his status was now even strengthened, he knew where the nukes were, and he got a royal wife, who bore him a son, Nanner, the first Anunnaki born on Earth. Their second child was added. Nanner, however, is going to be a major character in our drama as we eventually come up to present time. A detail of the stele of Ernamu showing King Ernamu making an offering to the moon god Nanner. The stele dates to K2060 BC, image by Betman Corbis Ninma, who forgave Namer when he married Sudnai Lil, could now, with King Anu's blessing, start interacting with Ea again. The two met in Eden, and Ia made her pregnant. He told Ninma to give him a son, but she gave him a daughter. They tried again and again, but daughters were all they got, one after the other. Ia comforted himself in his despair over the fact that he couldn't get a son by flying a Reshkigal. Namer's son's daughter, to Cape Ogilhas on the tip of South Africa, and seduced her. She brought him his first son, Ninish Zidathoth, and Ereshkigal took command over the monitoring station on Cape
further, he bore his second son, Napoleon from birth, and was in charge to run the mining operations in South Africa. Nishida, on the other hand, had a foot in each camp. The Ankiites and the Enlilites, because both brothers' blood ran through his veins, and he supported them both over time, when Ninma refused to let Ia impregnate her anymore. Ia sent for his wife and son Iberu, Damkina and Marduk. On Earth, Ia and Damkina started to beget Ia's own son, the Ankiites, where Abdik, Ia's firstborn, and his earthborn half brothers, Nergal, Gibal, Damuzi, and Mangal, became the first members. Name Enlil also began his own clan with his son Enlil. They had two sons together, Nanar and Adid, whom reinforced him and his eldest son with Ninma, Ninurta, in their conflicts with the Ankiites. If we stop here in the story for a moment, we noticed that the gods were pretty promiscuous, and seldom stuck to one woman or wife. The same went for the women. They all slept around with each other, and incest and inbreeding was a game of the day to strengthen their position in the hierarchies. All these beings mentioned so far, besides the Anunnaki, who worked in the gold mines, were young royalties. Spoiled, power-hungry and arrogant. After have read most of Sitchin's books and other authors' work on the subject, I can't help but think about them as big, spoiled children, playing with fire. They may have been brilliant in many ways, but it seems to me they were bored as well, and created games that sometimes had some pretty serious and nasty consequences, as we shall see. Figure 17, from Sitchin, Z, 1983. The Stairway to Heaven, page 114, Sumerian frescoes of stone, the Enlil's lineage above, some of the Yankees below. Drive. Sasha Lesson, in his essay, Enki Speaks, summarizes Namer's achievements as follows. By 400,000 years ago, Enlil had built seven mission centers in Mesopotamia. The centers, Sipar the Spaceboard, Nipper, Mission Control, Batibira, Metallurgical Center, Shirupik, Med Center. He built his communication center, the DUR.AN.KI, the Bond Heaven Earth, a dimly lit chamber essential for talk with rockets en route between Nibiru and Earth. At Nipper. In years to follow, Nibirans and the slaves they drafted will war for the Duranki. After the deluge, 13,000 years ago, Enlil will relocate the Duranki to Jerusalem up on Mars, Anzu, who was the kinsman of the deceased former King Elalu, and his 300-hundred colonists, the IGG, now started a shuttle service, which brought the gold, transported from Africa to Mesopotamia, back to Nibiru. There it was pumped out in the atmosphere, and the planet was slowly healing. However, the IGG were not satisfied with the deal. They thought they had to work too hard, and they wanted more of the fruit that Ninma grew, which made the eater euphoric, and they had other demands as well. Anu sent them to Earth to talk to Namer, who was in charge down here. Reluctantly, Namer granted them a visit at Nipper, his capital. However, while Namer undressed, Anzu stole the key to the control room a kind of computer crystal and ran away. With this power tool, he now illegally claimed ownership of both Earth and Nibiru, and the IGG stood behind him. This was also a perfect way to take revenge on Anzu's kinsman, Alalu, he thought. To escape, Anzu forced Namer's pilot, Abgol, to take him back to the spaceboard, Shurupik. Ninurta, Namer's eldest son, took action and hunted Anzu down. He defeated him in an air battle and shot down his shuttle, whereafter he dragged Anzu before Namer and freed Abgol. The seven who judged Ia, Damkin and Inki, Marduk, Nanur, Namer, Ninma, and Ninurta sentenced Anzu to death and Ninurta was given the task to execute him, which he did. 
Figure 19, Millard is slaughtering Anzu. The matters became more complicated when it showed that Nanner, Namer's legal heir, had led the conspiracy against his own father to challenge his half-brother, Linerda for command of Earth. When Namer found out, he expelled Nanner from her, and Ninurda's position was strengthened. Because Nanner was forced something that was decided by the Nibiruane Council to honor Ninurda as the Enlil's successor on Earth. Namer, to make sure Ninurda obeyed and felt gratitude towards him, gave Ninurda a 50-headed missile out of his hidden Alalu collection. Ninurda was pleased and satisfied and then enforced the gold extraction process and continued the shipping of gold to Nibiru. But was Nanner really behind the plot against Ninurta, or was he just a pawn all thou an agreeable one for someone else? Dr. Lesson, with Sitchin's help, makes a quite plausible suggestion. Sitchin shows that Ia, allied through his marriage to Alalu's daughter Damkina and their son Marduk to the Alalu's lineage Matt affiliated, was part of the plot. It was with Ia's connivance that Anzu, kinsman of Alalu, is admitted to Enlil's inner sanctuary for energy source crystals, vital computer chips, orbital data panels, and control buttons for Earth and Earth Nibiru, Mars communication. Ia suggested Enlil and Turton Anzu as a stall to responding to the demands of the IGG. Sitchin, in the Twelfth Planet had earlier said the role of Anzu in the Lost Book of Enki's account of the revolt of the IGG pages 117, 121 was actually the role of Nanner and Lilson by his half-sister and legal wife, Sud was legal heir on Earth. Nanner's was a challenge to Ninurta and Lil's firstborn and heir on Nibiru to succeed to in Lil's command of Earth. In the Wars of Gods and Men, too, Anzu, the leader of the revolt is a descendant of Alulu Hiskrinson. In this version Anzu is an orphan adopted by the Mars service, rather than Anzu the pilot who took Ia to Earth and stayed on Mars to die with Alalu page 97. Both Nanner and Ia would have benefited if Anzu vanquished Ninurta. But it was Nanner, not Ia, that Enlil exiled in the aftermath of the IGG revolt. The Twelfth Planet pages 107-116. Anthropologists will recognize Enki's description as a classical system of segmentary patrilineal agnatic lineages. In segmentary patrilineages, collateral lines like those that descend from Ia and in Lilsite alliance through different mothers to other royal patrilineages. The Ia lineage within the Anu clan, and especially the Marduk line of the Ia's lineage, is allied with the Alalu clan for leverage against the Enlilites within the Anu clan. Marduk's line is a Matt affiliate of Alalu's clan. Matt affiliated alliances give lineages external allies as they vie for precedence and authority within their patricians. So, Namer had in his way defeated the Enkiites revolt, and armed with all these missiles, he felt quite powerful, and while Namer was intimidating the miners in South Africa with his nuclear power, Ia was now supposed to supervise them. The Enlil was a much harsher leader than Ia, the Enki, and the miners' conditions worsened considerably under Namer's ultimate leadership. And when the mining in Southeast Africa had continued for 144,000 years, the workers in the mines started feeling pretty upset about their conditions. On another account, Marduk emphasized with the IgG on Mars, whom he said got almost no elixir, and had no spaceport on Earth they were allowed to use. They were treated less than decent. The Enlil, however, was more stern about it, and told Marduk to go to Mars and take Anzu's body with him to have it buried there. And this was meant to play out as a symbol for what happens to those who go against Lord Namer. Ia was discouraged by the situation and felt he needed to do something. So he left the supervision of the mining project to form an Anuji, and went to what is today known as Zimbabwe together with Nangish Zida, his eldest son, and set up a laboratory to study the already existing species on Earth. Ia, a famous, ingenious scientist and geneticist on Nibiru, was fascinated over what he saw. He was especially interested in the Apemen, whom had been spotted all over the planet. 
More fascinating was their sympathy for other animals. In fact, the Epemen often freed the animals which were caught in Ananaki traps. He liked their strong emotions and their similarities in genetic setup to the Nibir ruins themselves. 6. Nuclear War, some 300,000 years ago. As a side note, this is not in Sitchin's books. Around this same time, the Lyrans and the Earth Lyrans were working on the Living Library. They knew that the Anunnaki had built their bases on the planet, and they just stayed away from them. Apparently, the Anunnaki had a bad reputation amongst the Lyrans. On the other hand, the latter knew this galaxy is an experiment in free will, and that they couldn't really stop the A.A.M.I from landing here and establish bases. However, the Lyrans were protective regarding the Living Library project, and while working on the side, they probably kept an eye on the Anunnaki, they continued their project. The Anunnaki must have been well aware of the Lyran presence. In South Africa, the miners complained that Anuji treated them too harshly, and when Anuji brought up the issue with Ia, the latter sided with the miners. Knowing more about how these two half-brothers, Ia and Namer thought, we can pretty well understand the plot that took shape in Ia's head. He contacted the miners and had their leaders conspire with him. He wanted them to continue nagging and complaining to bring Namer's attention, so that Ia could introduce a solution. A new species. The miners were more than happy to go with Ia's suggestion. When the miners started acting out, the Enlil was called upon the scene, and Ia returned from Zimbabwe. In Namer's presence, the miners put their mining tools on fire, backstabbed and even took Anuji as hostage, crying out how horrible their situation was. Many of them left the mines, headed for Namer's base, and surrounded it. The situation got out of hand, so Namer called for King Anu to resolve the situation. Namer was furious and wanted the revolting leaders executed, and with them, Ia as well, because he hadn't been able to keep them in check. Anu arrived at the scene and evaluated the situation and sided with the miners. He thought they were inhumanely treated, and that something needed to change. Ia told Nishizida that they should create a Lulu, a primitive worker, to do the miner's job. These beings already existed, and all they had to do was to mix their genes with theirs, like two serpents entwined, doubly helix DNA, and they would have the perfect hybrids to do the job. That way, the Anunnaki workers in the Abuzu Africa could be relieved once and for all. Namer, on the other hand, when been informed about the project, objected to it. He said that slavery was since long abandoned on Nibiru, and should not be reintroduced on Earth, and Ninurda added that they should make machines to do the work. Not hybrid slaves this is quite ironic, because from our perspective, the Anunnaki miners were no more than slaves themselves, as were the IGG on Mars. Ia emphasized that they should be helpers, not slaves. Namor disagreed, saying that creating hybrids were forbidden by law on Nibiru. But Ia tried to bypass this by pointing out that the Aitman DNA was very similar to their own and have to come from the same, original genes way back in time. All he was doing was to speed up their involvement by adding more of the Sam DNA. The issue was brought before Anu's council, and after both sides had had their say, the council voted in Ia's favor. They said they had to change the rules to save Nibiru, and if this is what it takes, so be it. Ia, to his great satisfaction, got free hands. Ia's research team were now working full speed to create an improved human race, but had some failures in the process, which created quite a few strange-looking creatures. In the meantime, the Lyrans saw what was coming and decided to interfere with the process. They did not want Homo erectus to be tampered with by the Anunnaki, as it interfered with their plans for the Living Library. The Earth Lyrans left Earth and eventually found a new home in the Pleiades. A war broke out on Earth between the two species of creator gods. 
the Lyrans and the Anunnaki, a war which ended in a nuclear disaster, after the Anunnaki had used some of the hidden nuclear weapons to defeat the old owners of the planet. This left parts of the world deserted, which was followed by a nuclear disaster. Evidence of this, and other nuclear wars in the past, have been found in the deeper layers of the Earth's surface. Figure 20, scientists of Nebord and Vincenti put forward a theory saying the ruins were of a nuclear blast as they found big stratums of clay and green glass. High temperature melted clay and sand, and they hardened immediately afterwards. Similar stratums of green glass can also found in Nevada deserts after every nuclear explosion. Just like the A.A.M.I had defeated the tall whites in their ancient past, the Anunnaki now defeated these creator gods as well, and those who survived fled from the planet, back to Lyra. However, some of the Pleiadians came back to Earth later and started working with the Anunnaki instead with their new seeding project, and the Renegade Group, which is currently channeled through Barbara Merchiniak, are doing so to take care of their karma from have done so. They consider Ia being their ancestor, which can be explained by Ia have had sexual relationships with Pleiadian females on the side. Something that happened a lot among the gods, as we have seen already. Many of them are not exactly monogamous, but very sexual and can thus be quite promiscuous. After the destruction created by the Atomic War, Earth now had new owners. The Anunnaki had just conquered a new world and expanded their empire with new real estate. But the original planners had not given up on Earth. The Lyrans and later on, a renegade Pleiadian group, were determined to continue their living library experiment in the future and have since then monitored the situation. In wait for the time when we humans will be able to activate our DNA and evolve, and thus escape from their oppressors. This time has now come.